One of the characteristics that Rose Wilder Lane found exasperating about her mother was how extraordinarily frugal she was. As you know by now, Laura Ingalls Wilder wrote her rough drafts on inexpensive school tablets. She used inexpensive pencils rather than fountain pens to write the little house books. When money was tight at Rocky Ridge Farm in the 1930s, she suggested to Rose that they could economize by shutting off their electricity. Kerosene and candles were far cheaper than electric bills. Even after the publication of her first two novels, Wilder used resources carefully. She began to receive fan mail, and in 1933, she received this one. My teacher has read us the book of The Little House in the Big Woods, and I would like to know if you have any more books like it, for I enjoyed the book very much. This student would have been surprised to learn that on the back of that fan letter, Wilder wrote a draft for the opening lines of her next book. In fact, at this period of her life, Wilder scribbled several different variations for the opening of the book she called Indian Country on the backs of letters from enthusiastic young readers, her editor, her former editor at The Ruralist, and even from her own daughter. Success hadn't changed Laura Ingalls Wilder. She was still a frugal woman who remained true to those early pioneer lessons of conserving supplies and resources. But these scraps of rough drafts, written on the back of fan mail and business correspondence, also illustrate that Wilder took her responsibility to her readers seriously. She worked hard at her craft, revising and rewriting her work. She didn't take success for granted. We've seen this quote before, but I think it makes sense to revisit it in the context of Wilder's development as a novelist. The only way I can write is to wander along with the story, then rewrite and rearrange and change it everywhere. So let's take a quick look at what Wilder scribbled on the back of a few of those letters as she wandered along with her third novel, Indian Country, or as we know it now, Little House on the Prairie. Version 1. It was late afternoon as the white-topped covered wagon moved slowly across the prairie. The two black ponies seemed tired of pulling it, and Mary and Laura were tired of riding in it. A wavy line cuts through these words. Here's version 2. A white-topped covered wagon moved slowly across the prairie, drawn by two black ponies. A man and a woman sat on the wagon seat in front. The man was driving, his bright blue eyes looking along the wagon trail ahead. But Wilder still wasn't happy. She scratched out phrases she didn't like, circled words she wanted to change, and inserted whole sentences. For her more polished draft of the novel, the opening scene reads, a white-topped covered wagon drawn by two black ponies moved slowly across the prairie in southern Kansas. A brindle bulldog trotted in the shade underneath. A man and a woman sat on the spring seat at the very front of the wagon. The man was driving, his bright blue eyes looking ahead along the wagon trail, his brown beard blowing in the wind. Wilder knew she had to get the opening for this book just right not only because it was a sequel to Little House in the Big Woods, but because that first book had ended with such peace and contentment. Why would the Ingalls family ever want to leave? But Laura lay awake a little while, listening to Pa's fiddle softly playing and to the lonely sound of the wind in the Big Woods. She looked at Pa on the bench by the hearth, the firelight gleaming on his brown hair and beard and glistening on the honey brown fiddle. She looked at Ma, gently rocking and knitting. She was glad that the cozy house and Pa and Ma and the firelight and the music were now. Yet somehow, some way, Wilder had to build a convincing beginning for her new book. She had to find an engaging, plausible way to get the Ingalls family out of that cozy house in the big woods 
and onto the prairies of Indian Territory. Lane must have agreed, too, that getting the beginning just right for the sequel to Little House in the Big Woods was critically important. We have later correspondence about By the Shores of Silver Lake that documents how strongly both women felt about opening lines. If you talk to contemporary writers and editors, most will tell you that the opening of a novel or short story often determines whether readers will keep reading or not. In fact, many editors make a decision about reading an entire manuscript or even buying it within its first three pages. So openings are terrifically important in children's literature as well as adult literature. Take a look at these unforgettable opening lines from classic children's books. Once upon a time, there were four little rabbits, and their names were Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. They lived with their mother in a sandbank underneath the root of a very big fir tree. Now, my dears, said old Mrs. Rabbit one morning, you may go into the fields or down the lane, but don't go into Mr. McGregor's garden. Your father had an accident there. He was put in a pie by Mrs. McGregor. Notice the voice here. It's charming, but far from sweet. And the story introduces a sense of conflict and danger right away. Your father had an accident and was put in a pie by Mrs. McGregor. How can you not turn the page? Let's look at this one, which also opens with a hint of violence. Where's Papa going with that ax, said Fern to her mother as they were setting the table for breakfast. The voice of the character combined with instant conflict. The book, by the way, is perhaps flawless. But sometimes it takes a bit longer to create a memorable opening. Let's look at this example. The first week of August hangs at the very top of summer, the top of the live long year, like the highest seat of a Ferris wheel when it pauses in its turning. The weeks that come before are only a climb from balmy spring, and those that follow a drop to the chill of autumn. But the first week of August is motionless and hot. It is curiously silent, too, with blank white dawns and glaring noons and sunsets smeared with too much color. Often at night there is lightning, but it quivers all alone. There is no thunder, no relieving rain. These are strange and breathless days, the dog days, when people are led to do things they are sure to be sorry for after. Evocative, lyrical, and yet still fraught with conflict, the dog days when people are led to do things they are sure to be sorry for after. What about more recent books for young readers? This one, too, takes a bit of time to get started, but you can't put the book down. So bear with me as I read through this lengthy introduction to what has become a classic children's book. There is no lake at Camp Green Lake. There was once a very large lake here, the largest lake in Texas. That was over a hundred years ago. Now it is just a dry, flat wasteland. There used to be a town of Green Lake as well. The town shriveled and died up along with the lake and the people who lived there. During the summer, the daytime temperature hovers around 95 degrees in the shade, if you can find any shade. There's not much shade in a big dry lake. The only trees are two old oaks on the eastern edge of the lake. A hammock is stretched between the two trees, and a log cabin stands behind that. The campers are forbidden to lie in the hammock. It belongs to the warden. The warden owns the lake. Out on the lake, Rattlesnakes and scorpions find shade under rocks and in the holes dug by the campers. Here's a good rule to remember about rattlesnakes and scorpions. If you don't bother them, they won't bother you, usually. B. 
Being bitten by a scorpion or even a rattlesnake is not the worst thing that can happen to you. You won't die, usually. Sometimes a camper will try to be bitten by a scorpion or even a small rattlesnake. Then he will get to spend a day or two recovering in his tent instead of having to dig a hole out in the lake. But you don't want to be bitten by a yellow spotted lizard. That's the worst thing that can happen to you. You will die a slow and painful death, always. If you get bitten by a yellow spotted lizard, you might as well go into the shade of the oak trees and lie in the hammock. There is nothing anyone can do to you anymore. Obviously, beginnings are important. They establish a novel's unique voice, style, tone, and conflict. So let's look at Wilder's early draft for Indian Country one more time. A white-topped covered wagon drawn by two black ponies moves slowly across the prairie in southern Kansas. A brindle bulldog trotted in the shade underneath. A man and a woman sat on the spring seat at the very front of the wagon. The man was driving, his bright blue eyes looking ahead along the wagon trail, his brown beard blowing in the wind. Now, there's nothing wrong with this opening. It is well written and vivid, from the brindle bulldog to the spring seat. But its voice isn't especially memorable, and it doesn't bridge the gap between that cozy log cabin in the big woods and that white-topped covered wagon. Presumably, Lane knew this as well, because as her mother's editor, she helped Wilder find a more memorable opening with a distinctive voice and a bridge from the big woods to Indian Territory. A long time ago, when all the grandfathers and grandmothers of today were little boys and little girls, or very small babies, or perhaps not even born, Pa and Ma and Mary and Laura and baby Carrie left their little house in the big woods of Wisconsin. They drove away and left it lonely and empty in the clearing among the big trees, and they never saw the little house again. They were going to the Indian country. Notice here, too, that there's a sense of timelessness in this passage. Unlike Little House in the Big Woods and Farmer Boy, with their very specific references to time in their opening lines, it's almost as if Wilder and Lane recognized that this book would cast a spell over generations of young readers. Like the opening lines in Charlotte's Web, this is a flawless beginning. But this opening was complicated for Wilder, not just because she was writing a sequel to Little House in the Big Woods. It was also challenging because in terms of Wilder's own life, Little House in the Big Woods should have been the sequel to Indian Country. As we've seen, Wilder's first childhood memories were of her family's experiences in Kansas, not Wisconsin. So Wilder had to find a creative and believable way to smooth over the first major shift she had to make in her own personal timeline between her real experiences and the fictional ones she would create for her characters in the book. 